Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Gemology for Schmucks. My name is Peter Nelson, and I'm here to guide you in everything you need to know about gemstones and jewelry. Today, we're going to go back to those nine carat gold rings that I was alluding to in a previous episode. That originally came from a class ring that had a yellow stone in it, but we didn't know what the stone was. Today, we're going to identify that class ring stone. Look, I've got it right here in a baggie along with the other pieces of gold that were remaining from that ring. All bits of wire now. So let's investigate. Now some of you may be worried. I've got metal in with a gemstone. Couldn't this scratch it? And the answer is not likely. Precious metals such as gold, silver, and platinum are much, much lower down on the hardness scale than most gemstones. And that's to even include marginally soft gemstones. So in the vast majority of cases, I'm not worried about gold being next to a gemstone at all. We put it in jewelry for a reason, right? Now, if you're going out to the park and you're break dancing on gravel, well, there might be granite and other things inside of that gravel. So maybe take off your jewels for that, or just wear a stately pendant, a choker. That way it doesn't fly off while you're break dancing. Anyway, your hobbies are your concern. My concern is the gemstone. Putting our gold aside, the first thing, as usual, we've got our pen and paper, we've got our refractometer, polariscope, and whatever's in my gem kit. And what we're gonna do first is observe. Now, what I see is a yellow stone, and if I pull out my loop and inspect a little bit closer, I can see that there are facet abrasions. Where those facets meet the junction points, some of those are chipped. So this is a very normal place for the gemstone to get chipped because they're points that stick up. And as the old Japanese saying goes, the nail that sticks up gets hit down. So too with your meat points, unfortunately. But what does that say for us? It doesn't tell us exactly what the stone is, but it does give us some indication. Because if the points are breaking, but nothing else seems to be abrading or getting scratches, then it tells us it's probably a pretty hard stone. Even the hardest stones, like diamonds, will still chip if you hit them. Diamonds even have a certain degree of cleavage. So if you were to drop it, or throw it forcefully upon the ground, pointy bits like the culet down in the bottom are very likely to chip. Hard, but not tough. Just like my emotions. The other thing that this helps us to know is the way that it breaks. If the breaks are conchoidal or shell-like, that tells us something about the structure of the crystal. If they're granular, that tells us something different. If they break in flat sheets, that tells us something different. But this is about as close to a conchoidal fracture, the shell-like fracture, as we can really expect. One thing that I don't see is a rounding of those facet junctions. If this was a softer stone, perhaps something like glass or plastic, then rounding of the facet junctions over time would be sensible. Because remember, this came out of a high school ring from 1969. It's been bouncing around for 50 years. Even if it's in your drawer hitting other pieces of jewelry, you might expect some sort of wear and tear on softer stones. So this is probably not that soft, probably. Let's get some more definitive information. I like free tests, so we're gonna start off with the polariscope. We've got it in cross filters, rotating it around, and I do see it blinking. So what we're gonna do, just like I did in the polariscope video, is we're gonna try and find that optic figure with the conoscope. Now this is a faceted stone, so it's much harder to find than on those cabochons. That's why I made the set for you. But if we give it some time to have some patience, we may be able to find those interference colors. Now, unfortunately, I think I do find the interference colors, but they're right on the girdle. So even with the conoscope, and this seems to be an unpolished girdle, so getting those interference colors to resolve into the optic figure, that pattern that we would be looking for, is incredibly difficult. In this case, I don't really want to spend an hour on it, so I'm just going to move on to something more definitive. I can get the same amount of information, albeit with a little bit more work and observation, from the refractometer. So we're going to move on to that one. Goodness, giving me a troubles. Grabbing our refractometer liquid. Ah, I need tissues. Tissue acquired. Going to clean off our stone as usual. Remove the lens. Tiniest amount of refractometer liquid. Find the shadow. Bobble our head up and down to do that. Replace the lens. Okay. 
So the first thing that I notice is that the line of the shadow is bouncing clearly up and down. And right now it looks like 1.76 to 1.77. But to be cautious, we're going to rotate the stone 180 degrees, just as we have in previous videos. And if you're very observant, you might notice that the amount of birefringence at the beginning was very large and then it seems to get smaller. That's normal. As you go through the cycle, the position that you have the stone oriented may have a different apparent birefringence. That's why we have to go all the way through 180 degrees. That will give us the idea of the maximum birefringence. And it's also why instead of just doing two positions, you might want to do many. Okay, so there we go. We've got 1.76 to 1.77, maximum birefringence of 0.1, which is pretty large. Not huge, but pretty large. Clearly it's doubly refractive, because otherwise we couldn't have birefringence. And it seems to be uniaxial. Now how would I know that with a refractometer? With the refractometer, uniaxial stones will have one of the readings stay solid where it is, and then the other will bounce around. Now it could be the top or it could be the bottom number that will move. That's for a positive and negative sign. But one of those will stay where it is. With biaxial stones, both of those can move. Whichever one moves more shows you whether it's positive or negative. Now that's deeper knowledge. You don't need to worry about that at the beginning, but in certain circumstances, it can be very useful to help you distinguish some tricky stones. So as usual, we're gonna clean off this refractometer before the liquid crystallizes, making sure we don't lick our hands because this is poisonous and stinky. Now, if you were testing multiple stones in a row, you could use that same liquid as long as it doesn't dry out. As the liquid starts to dry out, it crystallizes and that does two things. The crystallized refractometer, previously liquid, can scratch the hemicylinder and it also will start to go dull in the window. The reading will not be as clear. So if it starts to dry out, just wipe it off, reapply. Continue testing. So let's look at our charts and compare what we've got so far. Nope, these are low RI ranges, don't need that. Medium RI ranges. And high RI ranges. So 1.76, we've got pyrope almondine garnets. 1.76, corundum, that's ruby and sapphire. 1.762 to 1.77. Synthetic corundum of several types. Flame fusion, flux, hydrothermal. These are all different manufacturing styles or processes. Grossler andradite garnet group also, that's 1.77 to 1.77 with some variants. Pionite and almondine, 1.79. So these are all within the range and we're leaving some space because in nature there can be some variants, right? But let's go back to our characteristics. We know that this is a doubly refractive stone. We tested it in two different instruments, we are sure. And birefringence is only possible with doubly refractive stones. We clearly saw a birefringence of 0.1. So we can go ahead and scratch off pyrope almondine or pyrope spessartine. These garnets are clearly not birefringent. Corundum, ruby sapphire, 1.762 to 1.77 with a birefringence of 0.008 to 0.01. That's very close to what we had, isn't it? Moving on, synthetic corundum, same characteristics as natural, so that's possible. Grossular andradite, not birefringent. Pionite is birefringent, but look at that birefringence, 0.029. That's about three times the size of what we had, scratching that off the list. And almondine, also singly refractive. So it sounds like really all we've got available to us is corundum of some kind. We don't know if it's natural or synthetic at this point. So what do we do next? Well, I'll tell you what, you would really need a microscope at this point. If you are very good with a loop, you might be able to tell the difference. But what's important now is the lighting conditions. So what I've got right here is a microscope that I use for jewelry work. Could this work as a gemological microscope? Yes. This goes up to 30 times magnification, and that is sufficient for a lot of gemological work. But the problem is the lighting basin. So most gemological microscopes are going to have a lighting basin with a few different types of lighting available to it. There's an iris that opens and closes to allow direct light, 
or bright field lighting. And there's also dark field lighting, which is where the light is bounced around through mirrors so that the light comes at the stone from the sides. These two different types of lighting conditions allow us to explore different characteristics inside of the stone. And then oftentimes there will be a fiber optic light that allows us more intense directional lighting ability. So when you're looking for natural and synthetic, that's actually a very important thing to have. Because at this point, it's really the inclusion scenes and being aware of what inclusion scenes go with natural and which inclusion scenes go with synthetic. So what I'm gonna go ahead and say is that we have narrowed down that this is corundum, but the final call as to whether it's natural or synthetic, I'm gonna leave up to the lab. This puppy isn't gonna cut it at the moment, not without that dark field lighting environment. And also I can tell you from my student days, that natural yellow sapphires are also oftentimes incredibly clean. You can spend 15, 20, 30 minutes looking at a stone in various lighting conditions and not find any evidence to the left or to the right. Is it natural or is it synthetic? If we do not find any clear evidence to the left or to the right, a respectable gemologist will say, I don't know. So at that point, we would have to send it off to an advanced lab with more advanced instruments, oftentimes which cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And those instruments can test things like trace element chemistry and other things to give them a better call on whether it's natural or synthetic. So we're gonna stop there today. The class ring from 1969 has a piece of corundum, whether it's natural or synthetic, who knows? And if you enjoyed this kind of content, you should head over to gemshepherd.com where you can get on my mailing list, hearing exclusive content and getting exposure to certain stones and jewels before the rest of the general public. Sometimes the general public doesn't get to know about them at all. Otherwise, hit like, hit subscribe if you haven't already. Tell all your friends about me. Until next time, bye-bye.